Hi, um, I'm Josh, and um, uh, I'm commonly known as God Josh. Yes, it's a reference to a 1993 advertisement of, of God Milk. And when I'm not coding, I'm usually snowboarding, as you can see over there in the picture. I'm a principal software engineer at Grafana Labs, a Prometheus maintainer, and I'm internally known as a metrics as a alerting guy, which is a title that I've been trying to shake off for a while now that I'm back <laughs> on the metrics team. And I'm Richie, uh, also Prometheus maintainer, part of the office of the CTO at Grafana. Um, yeah. So a little bit of a show of hands. If you use Prometheus, please raise your hands. Keep them up if you think you are like beginner level or, or higher, sorry. Like keep them up and only take them down if once it doesn't apply to you. Take them, uh, keep them up if you think you are intermediate to advanced and keep them up if you think you're advanced. Thank you. This helps us roughly uh, Just. figure out how much intro versus, versus deep dive we do during the thing, because we have some lever here. So thank you. Uh. <laughs> okay, so what is Prometheus, right? Prometheus is a metrics-based monitoring system and alerting stack. Um, we have a very rich instrumentation ecosystem for all kinds of applications and, um, uh, and systems in general. Um, Prometheus, in Prometheus itself is in charge of doing all the metric collection and storage. And once it's collected, you can do all the things, all the cool things that you hear about, right? Like you can do the querying of the metrics, you can do alerting on them, you can dashboard them in pretty graphs. Um, there's a bunch of exporters for all levels of the stack, so this is not just about your application. It's like there's hundreds of different use cases for things you can monitor with Prometheus. Um, and it's designed from the ground up to uh, cater for cloud dynamic environments, right? So it can handle churn really, really well. And hence, we're here at a cloud native event as a whole. Um, a little bit about the architecture, as you can see. So first, we have the exporters, right? So this is the thing where Prometheus will be collecting metrics from. It can be your application, it can be your database, be an exporter, all sorts of things. The next step in that process is the scraping. So this is when Prometheus actually grabs the metrics from the given exporters and then inserts them into what we call the TSDB, time series databases for short. Um, and this is where your metrics are essentially stored, right? Uh, you can then query them with PromQL in order to do pretty graphs and dashboards and things. And you can see right at the top that this is the same thing you can do with rules, right? So you can use PromQL in order to query the Prometheus database and um, design and build your recording rules or alerting rules. Um, the biggest thing and the most important one is the service discovery. Um, you can just point this straight up to uh, Kubernetes and it will immediately know what it is that it needs to fetch, what kind of metrics where your pods live, um, your applications live, and it will immediately store them into the TSDB. It, it's certainly like magic, right? Like this is why Prometheus is the de facto standard for Kubernetes monitoring, right? And this is what part of the sauce that made Kubernetes such an awesome piece of software at the end of the day. Did I miss anything? No. Cool. A little bit about the history of Prometheus. Um, originally developed in 2012 uh, at SoundCloud. Um, joined the CNCF, has the second project ever in 2016. And the first project was Kubernetes, of course, right? Um, released 2.0 in 2017, so that's almost seven years ago now. And graduated the CNCF in 2018. It was the second project ever after Kubernetes as well, right? Um, the good people at Honey put a really cool documentary. I uh, left you with a QR code and the video over there. I think everyone should watch it. It gives you a little bit of a um, you know, wider lens in the Prometheus history. And I, I just think it's really cool, right? Like, I just think just watching the history of a piece of software and trying to understand the rationale behind it, it's something amazing. Um, so if you have the chance, just you know, go ahead and watch it. A little bit up the top, a little bit at the bottom, we have the Prometheus adoption, these are some numbers that Grafana Labs provides to us on a yearly basis, specifically at PromCon, which is the Prometheus conference. Um, and you can see that even in 2024, right, like Prometheus has steady adoption throughout the years, continues to grow at a very steady pace. Okay, cool. So now we should talk about what's new specifically. Um, first of all, the releases since last year. So we have four main releases. This is typically less than what we usually release within the year. 
but we have been very busy trying to put 3.0 together. Um, we have one LTS release that's guarantees. It just speaks to the accessibility of the long-term support stable release. So if you care about you know, not having the latest features and just having your Prometheus instance working as a whole, we do have a, a, an LTS version, basically. Prometheus Alert Manager, which is one of the pieces that I actually maintain, I'm really proud that in version uh, 0, 0 0.28, um, we actually included four new receivers, right? So we now have four integrations that you can actually send your alerts to uh, on top of a bunch of goodies, such as like less resource consumption, you know, and, and overall really, a, really nice additions to the existing uh, integrations that we have over there as well. Uh, we have too many, way too many uh, exporter updates to even begin to list, right? It's like the ones that you care about, you should go and get up and check them out. And a really cool thing that happened this morning by, by Richie is that we actually merged into Prometheus community the yet another CloudWatch exporter, which is the most famous um, CloudWatch exporter out there. And this just really speaks you know, to the passion that the community has when it comes to uh, donating, building things and then donating them back to, to Prometheus. Cool. Um, without further ado, I really want to talk about Prometheus 3.0. And this is probably one of my favorite features that we have right here. Uh, we have a completely new developed UI or UX um, built from the ground up in, in, um, uh, in React. Uh, really beautiful, right? Uh, very different from what we had before. Uh, you have many different settings, including the, the graph of the resolutions. Uh, but if you, talk, if you ask me what is the one thing that I like the most about this new UI is the query explainer, right? It's like, here, you can see straight up what your query is doing. I struggled a lot with PromQL in the past, right? Trying to figure out, okay, what the hell my query is doing. Um, now you can see it straight up in the UI, what's actually happened, right? Like, what is this function for? And you know, you know what the really cool thing about this is that this is actually interacting with your own data in Prometheus, right? This is not just some sort of static analysis that tells you, Hey, you know, it's like your query is malformed, your syntax is wrong. It's no, th no, this is actually in some cases, as you can see here, it's telling you that the data that you have and the query that you're trying to build, it's not compatible, right? Uh, I think this is just, you know, amazing in all sense of the word. Um, I need to figure it out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, let's talk native histograms. Um, for those who, who have known uh, Prometheus for some time, um, histograms are incredibly powerful and they give you a really, really good way to, to determine how this and that API, that HTTP endpoint, that whatever, is actually behaving and how your users are perceiving performance. It's not like the, the usual average or something. Like actually put them into buckets and figure out, okay, who's like in the really bad spot or what are the really slow queries. Even if 99.99% .99 of my queries are super quick, uh, maybe a few of them aren't, and those are the ones I actually need to care about at some point, because I else my users will be unhappy, no matter if they're internal or external users, doesn't matter. So it used to be quite involved to, to, uh, to define those, and the new style is simpler, in my opinion. But the main thing about the native histograms is, if you look at this, this is, a, this is the heat map of a histogram. So what you see here is basically just a distribution of, um, of stuff. And now you need to debug stuff. And clearly, from, from what you can see here, in, in your lower buckets of, 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 your, of your level, that's where you have most of the hits. But there's one kind of dirty secret. If you implement native histograms, you need to already have good knowledge about what what boundaries for your buckets you need to have, because otherwise you can't really set good ones. But if you set too many, it's going to become too expensive, in particular at scale. Like, okay, you do this one thing on your laptop, cool, whatever, you have 10 or you have 20, doesn't matter, but now you have 1,000 pods, really starts to add up. So you need to be careful, you need to have this balance, and you used to need to readjust it all the time. So when you look at this, obviously, clearly, something is happening in the lowest ones. This is the same data with native histograms. And this shows you how it's not only more efficient and easier to do, and you have to do less mental overhead and less mental work to get started with native histograms. Like, all of those things are true, yes. But you actually get higher resolution data, and stuff which has previously been hidden is all of a sudden being made available and obvious to you. 
And it's really, really nice to just like basically reduce the amount of thought and reduce the amount of co coding which you have to do and get better results. And also to be clear, the native histograms in Prometheus and in OpenTelemetry, they were actually collaborative. Like initially there were some, some, some hairy parts, but they are completely 100% the same. So you don't have this thing where it's slightly different. It's 100% the same. Remote, right. Remote, remote right remained unchanged for almost seven years. And given the importance of the aspect of Prometheus, it's almost amazing that it got us this far. I think it speak, speaks wonders of you know, how well designed the protocol was the first time around. Prometheus is you know, pull based for a reason. And if we want to have the performance and reliability that deserves a monitoring system, pulling data, that we, pulling data is what we consider ultimately the right thing in Prometheus, right? Uh, however, the message the message and needs were loud and clear uh, from the community. Getting your, data out of, getting your data out of Prometheus reliably and efficiently into other systems is crucial for the operation and scaling of your monitoring needs. Over the year, we have observed an influx of projects like Cortex, Thanos, Mimir, and other Prometheus-compatible backends built around Prometheus. And no, we know and understand that Prometheus Federation is not the solution to the problem at the end of the day. So with Prometheus 3.0, we have completely overhauled our remote writer specification, and we're now releasing as version 2.0. But how exactly did we actually make it better, right? Let me walk you through an example. First, in here, you can see that we have one metric with different labels and different samples, right? And you can see the verbosity of the actual uh, payload on the, on the right, right? Like you can see that the labels are duplicated, uh, the number of values are there, and the timestamps as well, right? So like if you, look, if you look at the new version, you can see now that we use a technique called string interning. It's pretty similar to what we already use within the TSDV uh, at the, and the index, and we call it a symbol table. Um, defining the values once and then referencing the original definition can save us a lot of space, you know, and optimize compression at the end of the day. Um, as such, the results of this change are out of the waters, right? It's like we have less messages over the wire at the end of the day, almost 60%. Um, we have less allocation, almost 90%. And we have uh, better CPU utilization, almost 70% down from what we had before. But like the important part is not really the resource consumption, it's the resource consumption on top of the added features that the new protocol has, right? So now you can use the new native histograms uh, format for your classic histograms as well. Um, you have the exemplars, you have metadata to always send on. These were things that you, would need to you needed to control depending on how much resource usage you wanted to use and how much, how much message over the wire in version one. And in version two, you get all this performance with all those features enabled basically for free. So, um, from, on a very personal level, I've, I've been working for or towards compatibility between what is now open, uh, open Telemetry and Prometheus even before it had the name Open Telemetry. Like initially those discussions started somewhere in 2017, 2018 with Open Census. It's been a really, really long road and there are, there are a lot of, of things which we had to have which we had to do over the years. Um, so initially it was more on the side of, of trying to improve on the open telemetry side. So this promise of full Prometheus compatibility could actually become true. And there were a lot of, of hairing problems which we had like bucket boundaries of the histograms and, and all like a load of stuff which just didn't align. And a lot of those work has already been done and it's in the past. People might not be fully aware of this because it didn't make big news for some reason. I mean, probably because there was always this promise already of this being compatible, so it was less of big news. But short version, if you're using open telemetry for your metrics pipeline, you can literally just uh, enable the OTLP endpoint and you can start pushing your stuff into, into uh, Prometheus. Like there's a lot of reasons why we as Prometheus authors, like with my Prometheus head on, why I strongly prefer the pull-based model, and we'll see a little bit of this later. And like from a networking perspective, it's just more resilient and robust, but that doesn't matter as long as users also want to be using push, and you can, both with Prometheus Remote Write 2.0 and with OTLP. This is how you would do the translation uh, from OTLP into, into Prometheus. And for those who have seen this previously, it's a little bit different now. Uh, what you can see is we don't escape UTF-8 anymore. 
And what you also can see down below, and this is relevant for any push-based system, we have an out-of-order window here for 30 minutes. You can define this as you choose. Because the thing is, if you push data, you, you lose a lot of guarantees which are just built in and, and normal and just there with a pull-based model. One of them is that your data arrives in order. That is out of the window with a push-based model. Of course, you will have delays somewhere. It will happen someday, and you need to account for it. So you can just define how long is, is too long for still allowing out-of-order stuff to be put into Prometheus. Everything else would be rejected. Um, what you can see here is how, how it looks for the, um, for the open telemetry side up above and for the Prometheus side down below. What you can see is this is an up-down counter. So open telemetry has two types of gorges. They're functionally equivalent as far as I'm concerned, and I have made this point within open telemetry since 2020 at, le at the latest, uh, but it doesn't matter. Like from P Prometheus perspective, you just have a gorge, and you, as you can see, you actually have the exact same name. You don't have to escape your dots or anything anymore. Speaking of dots. And to be clear, when I say dots here, this also means anything within UTF-8 directionally. But dots were the most pressing thing, so that's what we, what we engaged with first. Up above, you see the exposition format. For those who have, of you who have ever seen a metrics endpoint like on your Kubernetes or in your export or in your workloads or your whatever, this will look somewhat familiar. Like this is how the data is, is presented by your instrumented application in a Prometheus world. And you can see that we now escape this. And for those who, who are familiar with the format, this is not, the metric name is now part of, uh, of the stuff within the curlies, and it's now in, in double quotes. We might be able to get rid of this for some cases, like for example dots, but for the time being, we just play it safe, and we have this. Feedback highly appreciated, because we don't know what people want. We suspect they want their stuff, their monitoring stuff to be more stable than slightly more convenient, but you need to tell us. Um, and as you can see down below, if I want to qu query it, the same like 10-year-old, 12-year-old promise of Prometheus remains true. What you see and what you scrape, the data you get in, is also how you can get it out. So you don't have to like do a mental transformation or anything. You can literally use the same format for both exposing into Prometheus and for querying. And obviously, you can also do like more advanced use cases, and that's how the quoting would look there. I can't overstate how much work this was. Like, it, it sounds simple here, but honestly, it was a shit ton of work. Um, last PromCon, owned it, did a really good talk on some of the intricacies of this. If you want to scan the QR code, it just gives you, it just gets you to, to the talk. It goes a little bit into all the detail and all the, all the pain which had to be endured for this. And again, this is directionally the same for anything UTF-8. Dots, dots are just where we started because it's relatively well-contained and relatively easy and also had the highest impact for, for the least amount of user-visible change. Most of the backend has already been changed because otherwise we couldn't have. Uh, another thing which is coming soon, um, mentally blocking, ah yeah, the created timestamp. <clears throat> so um, with my open metrics hat on, um, this is something we, we put into open metrics, the exposition format stand for Prometheus in I think it was 2018, maybe 2019. Uh, of course, Google in particular wanted to have this, where if you have a counter, yes, you can do your rate, and you, if you have resets and everything, everything is fine and everything just works. But the one thing which you couldn't do previously is, without at least some analysis, tell how old a counter was. And if you have the age of the counter, it gives you a really good way to, to make a determination how steep your angle of, of climb for whatever counter is. And Again, this, it sounds trivial, it sounds easy, but it is really, really hard to get this right with the level of performance which you're used to from Prometheus. Because this basically doubles the cardinality of all your, all your counters. It's really painful if you, if you do this in the simple way. We had to do this the hard way. <sighs> now we are back into, into pull versus push. Um, so, if you look at everything end to end, and I'm, I'm more than happy to defend this statement like find me after or anything, I, I, I can talk about this topic for hours. Um, from a information theoretical perspective, end to end, a pull model gives you better properties, period. Not open for debate, it is a scientific fact. One of the things, but it is more upfront work 
to be very clear. Like it's easier to just yeet something over the wall and it's someone else's problem and it's in the pipeline and maybe in the backend, whatever, I don't care about it anymore. Cool, really nice developer experience, but end to end and taking the operators and everyone into account, maybe not quite as nice. Prometheus made the very deliberate decision that counters don't go ever down. They only go up, which just monotonic increasing, which probably, I mean, in my opinion also, it, it's the definition of a counter, but whatever, the point is, um, you always expose everything, and you always expose just the uh, total amount, you just keep adding to it. There was a very early fundamental decision within open census, which is now open telemetry, to support deltas when you push counters or other data. So you only send what was changed. And this gives you fewer robustness guarantees, but that's not the point. The point is Prometheus is deliberately designed in a different way, and it is really, really painful to, to change all the parts of Prometheus to really properly and robustly support delta temporality. So when you see delta temporality, that is what this is about. That you don't have to send your complete counter every time and all the counters. You can actually only start sending bits and pieces of what actually changed. Again, you have, you have less guarantees on it, so if you ask me personally, I would still prefer the other model, but you can do it soon if you so choose. So, thank you, and if you have any, oh no, we forgot something. We have one more thing. Oh, we have one more thing. So we were talking about Prometheus 3 being in the future. Um, you are going to see this merged live right now. So, click the button. Bring this in. Do it without showing any internal work stuff. Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna do this one. I have a complete no He knows I don't go into Prometheus. The fact that you're not completely aesthetic about this tells me you have no idea how much work this was. This was <laughs> we are talking people years. <laughs> like in all, <clears throat> in all seriousness, oh, I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, so as is tradition, we are also getting all the other Prometheus maintainers on stage and anything you want to ask, just hit us. Come on up, we don't bite. Any questions? Someone has to ask a question. We can run with a microphone as well. So raise your hand as well if you want to ask a question. Maybe it's easier. Yeah. You can also run around with this one. So I'm curious about the alert manager and what's changing between the version changes. What can you tell me about it? In general, sorry, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, in general, we have we have four new receivers. That's kind of like the main thing. We have four new integrations. Um, we have a bunch of fixes around resource consumption, a couple of memory leaks that we have identified with silences. Uh, we entirely removed the API v1. Now it's not, you know, it's completely deprecated, so it's only a strictly v2. You'll see that you see these as well in Prometheus 3.0, where you can no longer use v1 of the alert manager. Uh, in general, is you know. Uh, the receivers, I'll say, the integrations is uh, the main thing. Um, and yeah, a couple of enhances to the other integrations that we have. I know this card got a lot of love from the community. So, you know, we added a bunch of fields that you can actually configure it over there. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, George, actually did all the work to support UTF-8 uh, in the alert manager. So now you can send alerts with emojis and dots and all of that in order to support um, the, the, the open telemetry initiative that you saw within Prometheus. This was all done in... Uh, Dot 28. Any other question? Sorry, follow up. So um, right now we do have Prometheus integrated, and I'll get um, alerts through Slack. So just kind of a follow up question with that: Is there any type of integrations going on with popular, say, PagerDuty or OpsG or anything? Yeah, so we do have an integration for uh, PagerDuty. We do have an integration for Ops Genie. And what we don't have is the V2 of Slack, but we do have the B1. So we don't have the adaptive cards. We're trying, we're actually looking for feedback, right? So like if you look around, uh, we do have a really big issue where we're trying to discuss how do we configure it, because that's generally the hard part. 
right? Like how do you configure the actual Slack integrations when you're using adaptive cards, I think it's called it. Um, and we're trying to decide how does the configuration look like at the end of the day in order to be able to support uh, that. that. That's useful for right now. I use Prometheus very much to see what has <coughs> happened. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in you know, changing that up to see what is happening or maybe even what could be happening. So that's cool. OK, cool. Uh, quick question. So uh, now that we've released uh, CDRO, uh, when will we have these uh, features available in uh, projects like Mimir or Thanos? Can you repeat the question? Sorry. When will we have the features in 3.0 available for Thanos and Mimir? So, uh, Bartek, do you want to take the Thanos one? I mean, it's on, on the roadmap. Uh, when I was talking about Thanos updates, uh, project updates, yeah, um, it's part of, the, part of the work, but for the timeline, please help if you want it sooner, but I would expect <laughs> in the next six months. Uh, I think for us, it's going to be a similar timeline. Uh, I know we're halfway through the upgrade in our Prometheus. Um, so I think, you know, next three to six months of a timeline before it actually reaches Mimir. Uh, and we actually release a new version, right? Like, because this is a tricky bit. It's like once you get all the changes in, you need to make sure they work correctly. There's no regressions. And then we'll publish a release with all those changes. So three to six months. Uh, thank you for presentation. I, I have a question to switch into the push model for Prometheus. So currently with pull model, there are cool features about atomicity of scrapes, and you can control like the limit of samples per job, uh, series per job, etc. And with push, uh, one request can contain data from multiple jobs from multiple services. Do you have any plans to control uh, to rate limit this or control amount of data that you push to Prometheus? How to protect backend in this? I don't think there are any current plans. And, um, so number two. Yeah, just talk around. No? Number two. Yeah, just turn it You don't turn this off. Around. Okay. Um, so the short version is that you can limit the like rate that remote write sends data at, um, but not the same way that scrapes are limited, right? So um, remote write just looks at all the data that Prometheus has ingested and sends it in that same order. Uh, but it has no notion of like whether or not certain data was part of scrape one and other data was part of scrape two. So you can, in general, rate limit remote write, but not in the same way that scrapes are limited. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the same related question to recording rules. Uh, if I remember correctly, Prometheus also has this atomicity of a scrape again. So it promises that recording rule gets complete data during evaluation. And now when we push data, there are no such promise, right? And are there any plans to? Yes? Uh, so we faced this problem very early on in Mimir. And the way that we solve it is that we basically delayed rule evaluation, right? It's like you at least have a guarantee that you're going to wait, I don't know, a certain amount of time before your data is there. So for rule that you evaluate in T, you can do evaluations to T minus 1, right? The cool thing about it is that I actually put that in Prometheus as well, right? It's an experimental feature. I put it about three or four months ago. You can actually use it. You can actually experiment with it and try to, you know, delay your recording rule evaluation or your alert evaluation by uh, whatever time you think it's necessary to have the guarantees for your data to come in and, you know, try to solve that problem that way. I think that's worked wonder wonderful for, for us, right? The delay is almost negligence if you're running your, your, if you're running your rules every five minutes, which is typical, right? Uh, it's only until you get the sub-minute evaluations that you start running into a little bit more problems with that. And even then, other things might break, right? Is there a plan to get that awesome explain UX um, visible in other like Prometheus UI, like Grafana, for example? Can, can, can you repeat, please? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, that, um, that new explain UX that you showed, um, is there a plan to get that visible in Grafana or other Prometheus UIs? I mean, you have three Grafana people on stage, but we are here to talk about Prometheus, so. <laughs> yeah, all right. But, I mean, at least tried in Prometheus, it's like it's really powerful, and, and e even like no matter who we, we happen to work for, um, it is really powerful, and it's really a a 
a huge refreshment to, to all of Prometheus. Highly encourage you to, to just play with it and try it. Um, you do have some, like you have similar functionality in Grafana, but again, that's not yeah. the focus of, of this yeah. talk. Thanks. We have probably time for maybe one or two questions at most. Well, are we? Oh, oh, okay, gotcha. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to ask about, uh, you know, the rise of open telemetry and how it differs from Prometheus. How did you kind of balance the decision to keep some of your opinions that you've talked about and also add the support for open telemetry? We are not changing our opinions. Um, and to be very clear, those opinions are based on a lot of operational pain and a lot of a lot of learnings across the wider industry. Um, so if you're asking what the happy golden path is, keep pulling. Um, if, you, if you look at what, what Kubernetes does with CubeSate metrics, it is pull only. If you look at what, what like most cloud native stuff does, it supports Prometheus as well pull. From an end-to-end -end perspective, you're going to have an easier time. You, and the nice thing is you get to offload a lot of the concerns of a pull-based model onto us, basically. Um, but all of this is irrelevant if a significant portion of the user base also wants to use push. And that's just the case. So we, we are not like closing our eyes and just being like, no, this is not happening. We are very much trying to support us and to be very clear from both the open telemetry and the Prometheus side. And with my personal head on, like I invested insane amounts of time on the open telemetry side into making all of this better. But none of this also changes, again, yet again, that we do have an opinion, and this is based on, on a lot of experience. So happy path remains, but we will support everything, uh, like either fixing it in open telemetry, like for example, the bucket boundaries, because it would be mathematically impossible to do, like to do it on the Prometheus side. It must, we need it, we must do it on open telemetry side, which is also why we did this first, way before this work, because it was just a more strategically important one. Um, yeah. Thank you. No worries. First of all, thanks for all your hard work. We really appreciate it and looking forward to trying out 3.0. My question is around custom exporters. Do you see a lot of work there to, to rewrite custom exporters or are they pretty much work the same as they have before with 3.0? Like, so if you keep using the old exposition format, it's going to keep working. Uh, if you use the exporter toolkit, which is the recommended way to do your custom exporters, um, you would just get all of this for free as we update the stuff. So you don't have to care about anything. Um, yeah. So, but I mean, I know people who just print F from their C and then they put it into a file and put it on a web server. Like, this will continue to work. So you don't have to do anything, but if you want to have a really nice experience, use the exporter toolkit and everything just happens for you. Yeah, okay, thank you. I think we don't have time for any more questions. We have two more yeah. minutes, so maybe one last question if anyone has it, or else we just stop here. Going once, going twice. Thank you very much.